much. All right, well, thank you all for being here, and thanks so much to the organizers of this conference. Um, so I'm a PhD student over at Stanford in the statistics department, so everything I'm going to talk about today is joint work with my advisor, Susan Athey, and our collaborators, Stefan and Julie. And today I want to talk to you all about random forests. So we all love random forests. They're an incredibly powerful prediction method. They win all kinds of contests, and they're pretty easy to use with minimal tuning. But they do suffer from a pretty large problem, which emerges when you try to fit something kind of smooth. So you can see that in this simulation here. We've generated data in 20 dimensions and just put some signal in one coordinate. Uh, and you can see the signal in black here and random forest predictions in red. So the forest did a pretty bad job here. <laughs> the forest basically just fit a step function to this curve. And intuitively, you can think about how a forest sees which points appear together in a leaf, but not if one point consistently appears on an edge of a leaf. So when you have data like this, it's just not able to fit the appropriate function, and you end up with really bad predictions. Now, the fix that we're going to use for this is in the spirit of moving from kernel regression to local linear regression. So up in the slides, you can see a pretty nice image of kernel regression. So here you have test points, in, you have data training points in blue and a test point, and you fit a Euclidean kernel, which you can see here in yellow, which is just a function of the distance between your training points and your test point. And then you fit a weighted mean, where if you have something that has a high kernel weight, you'll weight the response highly, and far away, you won't give it any weight. So you get this nice non-parametric fit to your data. And it works pretty well in the middle, but you can see it suffers from a bad boundary bias at the edge. And it's the same problem. So your kernel can tell you if you're close to the test point, but it can't tell you if you're to the right or to the left. So if you're on the boundary, you're getting these consistently biased predictions. But there's a really nice fix to that. So instead of fitting a local mean, you just fit a local line, and then you can fix that boundary bias problem. So these images, by the way, are from Wikipedia, and I liked them so much that I finally donated the $3. <laughs> Um, so local linear regression is a really great method in low dimensions, but it works pretty poorly. So any R implementation you can find, for example, will break down once you get more than four or six predictors. And think about how you're fitting this symmetric kernel unless you have extremely densely sampled data that's just not going to do a very good job until you have a really large kernel. And it's computationally very expensive. So we've ended up with this space. We have local linear regression that can fit these smooth objects, and we have random forests that are very data adaptive and work quite well in high dimensions, but there's room for improvement. OK, so the goal of this work is to improve both of those methods by leveraging the strengths of the other. And the way we're going to do this is by thinking about random forests not as average of trees methods, but as generators of local neighborhoods. So on the top row here is an example of three trees from a forest where the lines just represent recursive partitions of the data. And the blue, the blue cross is a test point. So traditionally in forests, we would think about you average all the points in the first box, and then in the second box, and then in the third box, and average all of those together. But equivalently, we could say, I'm going to use trees to tell me how close I am to my, to my neighbors. So if I'm in the same leaf as you a lot of the time, you probably have a lot of information for estimating about me. And if we're never in the same leaf, we're probably not that similar, and we don't share that much information. And you can see that in the lower, in the lower half of this slide. So now it, we have points, the larger points have high kernel weights. So these are the points that were very frequently in the same leaf as your test point. And then you have those smaller points, which were never in the same leaf. So basically, we're using a forest to generate a data adaptive kernel. And that motivates the algorithm that I'm going to talk to you about today. So we begin by just training a forest right now to predict the regression function, so the conditional mean. Now, under the hood here is a lot of interesting work on how you should train a forest, given what you're going to do with it. I don't have time to talk about that today. But if you're interested, please come talk to me, because I think it's a really interesting part of this work. So you take a test point. And for each test point, you have training, training weights, like we saw on the previous slide, that correspond to each of your training data points. And you're just going to use those force weights to run a locally weighted regression at your test point. So here you have the conditional mean function mu and theta, which models your local slope. And then you have a weighted least squares minimization problem weighted by the forest weight. And we add in a ridge penalty. Because in practice, regularizing it seems to be always a good idea. And it's actually quite central to proving things about these predictions. OK, so those of you familiar with local linear regression will recognize that this looks about the same, except with the forest weight in place of that kernel. 
And also, because we framed it as this minimization problem, it's actually really general, and we can extend it to other settings. So first things first, we should go back to the example that we looked at in the first slide and say, does this fix the problem? So this is a friendly example, right? It was a problem that we found, and then we generated an algorithm to fix it. So it should fix the picture, and it fixes the picture. OK, so first check, good. Sanity check works. Uh, but now we're going to look at it on a real data set and talk about where I think the real value of this kind of algorithm can come in. And that's in treatment effect estimation. So there's been a lot of interest in the last few years in learning a heterogeneous treatment effect. So the kind of classical example is if you're a doctor and you want to decide which patients to give which drug, it's sort of useful to know on average how the drug affects your patients. But what you really want to know is for any individual patient, what is this drug going to do? And that's an extremely difficult problem, right? Because I can never take a patient and both treat them and not treat them. So none of my training data has anything that I actually want to predict, which is the difference between treating and control. OK, so it's a very difficult problem to learn this. Uh, and Susan Athey and Hito Imbens designed causal trees to do this. Susan Athey and Stefan Wager extended this to causal forests. So we have these tree-based methods that can learn treatment effects. But because it's such a fundamentally difficult problem, any method that lets you leverage a little bit extra and squeeze more information out of your data is going to be extremely useful. So the theoretical setup for this, we follow the potential outcomes framework, where we have covariates. We're going to assume we have just a binary treatment, and then we observe a response. And our framework is going to be we see one of two potential outcomes, so basically what would have happened to you if we treated you or if we gave you the control. And we want to learn what's called the conditional average treatment effect, which is just the difference between those two potential outcomes. So here's the data set that we're going to use to explore this question. So the general social survey surveyed about 30,000 people in this 24-year period and asked them all kinds of questions, including what their political views were and how much money they make. Uh, and then they asked them what, they, what people thought about government spending on the social safety net. But they randomized it so that people got one of two questions. One question is, do you think the government spends too much on assistance to the poor? And the other question was, do you think the government spends too much on welfare? Now, welfare is this kind of funny word, right? It has this connotation of assistance to the poor is great. You're giving to charity. I love it. But welfare is you're taking my hard-earned tax dollars and giving them to very lazy people. It's not a fair connotation, right? They mean the same thing. But we all have this kind of negative reaction. And we're going to use this data set to tease out if that's actually real. So again, the treatment here is just your language of either assistance to the poor or welfare. And a positive predicted treatment effect would mean that using the phrase welfare as opposed to the phrase assistance to the poor makes me more likely to say, yeah, we spent too much. Now, here are some results on this. So on the left, we have political views. And on the right, we have income. What we've done here is stratified everybody by their category of political views and by income ran causal forests, which are shown in blue, and local linear causal forests, um, sorry, which are in blue, the causal forests are in red. So run the algorithm, and then made box plots of the predictions within each category. OK, and the lines just connect the medians of each box plot. So there are a few things to notice here. One thing to notice is that the predicted treatment effects are pretty much always positive. OK, so there's no saints among us. We pretty much all have a negative reaction to this word. The second thing to notice is that both methods pick up pretty strong linear effects. So you can see across both of these covariates, both of the methods are picking up fairly monotonic trends. You can also look at the political views specifically and see a very big difference in terms of what kind of linear effect the methods picked up. Now, this in itself should not be a surprise. Right? We've designed these local linear forests to learn monotonic trends. It's in the name of the algorithm. So it's not a shock that they picked up a stronger linear trend. But what we see in these plots is that these trends do seem to be present in the data. So maybe this is actually helping. Now, we can actually evaluate this. So Susan Athey and Hito Imbens give an estimator for the error of any tau hat, so of any method that's estimating a treatment effect. 
And you can decompose it into two parts, one of which is an unbiased estimate of the error, and the other is a biased term, but you can estimate it from the data. Now, on this data set, we had about 30,000 observations, and any reasonable method actually predicts about the same across them. So the real interest here is when you subsample down and look at cases where you don't have access to 24 years worth of data, what can you do? So what I'm showing here is errors where we've uh, calculated the bias term and subtracted it out. Uh, and you can see that the local linear correction helps quite a lot. Now, those of you familiar with causal inference will know on real data sets, the effect sizes are small for heterogeneous treatment effect estimation. OK, so if these numbers look small, think about how it's a very, very hard problem. So these little improvements are actually incredibly meaningful. Now, to close out, I want to talk just briefly about how you can do inference with these objects. So one of the benefits that you get from imposing structure on your algorithm like this is that you can prove improved central limit theorems and get confidence intervals. So this is a central limit theorem for local linear forest predictions. Uh, you have to put some assumptions in the forest, most of which are things you would want to do in practice anyway. So for example, you have to split on all of your covariates with some very small probabilities, so you can't leave anything out, that kind of thing. The one I want to draw your attention to is the subsampling rate. So the subsampling rate is actually really central to controlling the bias variance trade-off of your forest and letting you prove something about it. And the subsampling rate just means when we grow trees, you can either bootstrap or subsample your data so that you grow all these different trees. Uh, and think about how if you gave all of your data to every single tree, you would have these very low variance estimates, but would be quite overfit to your data. So you'd have a very high bias. OK, so the subsampling rate under the hood here is actually very important. And then you can get the central limit theorem on your predictions. And we can use that with the delta method to build confidence intervals. So on the screen are examples of 95% confidence intervals on that same simulation we've been looking at this whole time. So here, again, the signal in this coordinate is in black, and the forest predictions are in red from random forests on the left and local linear forests on the right. And the gray lines connect the lower and upper ends of pointwise 95% confidence intervals. So you can see the random forest confidence intervals actually cross over the signal at the boundary there. And correspondingly, these have about 88% coverage in simulations. The local linear confidence intervals, on the other hand, are really nicely centered on the truth and average 95.5% coverage. So I think the takeaway there right, is that from leveraging this structure and smoothness when it's present, not only can we get these improved predictions, but we can get confidence intervals that work not only in theory, but actually in practice, and let us do uh, really great inference with random forests. So I'd like to thank my collaborators who are up here. And there's a link to the paper and also a note to the software package if you want to try out any, any of these experiments. Um, and at this point, I'd like to say thanks for listening. And I'd be happy to take any questions. We have a couple of questions. Or please come up to the mics if you have time. OK. Um, well, I guess I'm interested in what do you have planned next? What kinds of problems can you tackle as kind of an extension to this work? So we've been thinking a lot about policy estimation, so about evaluating the optimal policy, which we heard a little about earlier today from Joel. Um, this might be a really promising application for that. We've also thought about multi-armed bandits. Um, so navigating that explore-exploit trade-off is something where you might want to use this, where you expect you have a few like very linear covariates, so for example, lagged outcomes. Um, where you'd want to do this linear correction, and then other things where you don't quite know what to do. Excellent. We've got one question over here. Uh, thanks for the talk. A quick question. How scalable is your algorithm? So we've been working on that quite a lot. So I would say, first off, if you have like 5 million data points, you shouldn't run 5 million regressions. Um, if you actually want a prediction at every single one, this is not the right thing to do. But we have a uh, computer science PhD student at Stanford, Edward Gann, who's done some really wonderful work on um, making this as fast as possible. And working on making it distributed is the next step for our software package. All right, excellent. Great talk. Thank you, Rina.